Welcome to Cascade's sixth annual adoption lecture. Just to let you know that we are recording this session. So I'm really pleased to welcome Professor Beth Neal today. Beth Neal is based at the University of East Anglia and is very well known for her work on adoption. And we've, it's really pleasing that it's garnered such interest here today and that we've had um, 100 people sign up for today's lecture. Um, today, uh, Beth is going to be basing her talk on a chapter in a recent book that she's written with Mary Beek, um, published in 2020. And Beth's going to explore the losses that adopted children can face and how these can be eased and moderated. Beth will speak for 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes for questions at the end. So we'll be finishing at 12 o'clock. So if you have any questions, if you could put them in the chat function and then we can pose them to Beth at the end. And a copy of this recording will be available on the Cascade and Exchange website by the end of the week. So for those who weren't able to attend today, they be, they'll be able to view it. So welcome, Beth. Thank you so much for giving your time to us today. And we're very much looking forward to your lecture. OK, thank you, Alison. And thank you very much for inviting me. Is my sound coming through OK? Yes, it's good. Good and clear. Great. OK, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is not based on one research study that I've carried out, but it's really drawing together themes from across a series of projects that we've carried out at UEA and trying to bring some ideas together about ways in which I think we can improve our adoption offer for children being placed today. So it's around this theme of how can we really respect and promote children's identities and relationships. So plural, really, thinking about all their multiple relationships and identities that they have. So we know that adoption has both gains and losses for children. I mean, the reason why we pursue adoption for children in care is because it offers permanency. You know, we're hoping to offer children lifelong relationships, a sense of really belonging and being part in their, of their adoptive family, being safe when they may have come from a context where they haven't been safe, and offering children a chance for developmental recovery to, you know, get over experiences of abuse, neglect, etc. And we know that adoption does offer children um, a lot of these positives in most situations. But the other side of adoption is the ambiguous and disenfranchised loss that people experience. So adopted children lose their birth family connections, they lose their legal membership of their birth family, and they often lose any actual face-to-face -face contact with members of their birth family. So they lose that side of their identity and those relationships. They lose their foster family as well. And I think this is a, a loss that's often overlooked. And together, these losses mean that adopted people can really struggle to uh, develop a, a really secure and positive sense of identity. And I think these losses are both ambiguous and disenfranchised. So by ambiguous, I mean, you know, their birth family, their foster family, they haven't died, they still exist, they're still out there somewhere. But for the adopted child, they often don't know where they are, what's happened to them, what they're doing now. So it's a very ambiguous form of loss. And it's a disenfranchised loss because it's not always recognised. And I think it's particularly not recognised um, when there is, you know, this huge focus on you've got this new family now. Aren't you lucky? Aren't you special? Um, you've got this new life. And that obscures what children have lost. 
So I think we've known about some of these losses for many, many years now. So here's some quotes from the study in Scotland by John Tresiliotis, which was 1973, when he talked to adopted adults. And they said things, they talked about their identity problems, you know, not knowing who they look like, feeling a stranger to themselves because of this lack, lack of connection with their birth family. Feeling that you're only half a person, you know, not being able to have this secure sense of self. And the kind of social losses, feeling you've got a stigmatized identity, that you're in a minority, that people judge you because of your status as an adopted person. Can I, can I interject just for a second? Sorry, there's an, a, quite a little bit of distortion on your mic. I don't know if it's just slightly too close to your mouth, perhaps. Just a, just a little bit as you're speaking. Okay, I'll try turning my um, volume down a little bit as well. How does that sound? Much better. Okay, give me another shout if it's still squeaky and I can pull it out and just use my laptop mic. Okay, well, let, have another go and I'll... I'll come okay. I need to, thank you. So, yes, 73, when was that? A long time ago, 40 odd years ago, John Tresiliotis was highlighting these losses and identity challenges for adopted people. So you think we'd have it cracked by now but these are all quotes from adoptees in um, a longitudinal study that I've carried out with colleagues at the UEA. These are adopted people aged mostly 17 to 19, um, talking about their experiences of being adopted and their birth family connections. So the first quote in blue, if I could get my mum to write to me, I would do that. And my brother, because he was like part of me. So a young person highlighting sibling loss as well. And also the fact that's very common we see from research, that letterbox contact often results in disappointment in people not actually exchanging letters over the years and young people whose parents maybe send a letter and nothing comes back. So there's another experience of loss. I want to see my birth dad. I want to meet him. And if he's a horrible person, then I'll deal with that then. This is a loss we noticed a lot in our study that where contact was set up with the birth family, it was generally with birth mothers, with maternal half siblings, with maternal grandparents, and everybody in the paternal side of the family tended to be excluded. And this was a loss that a lot of children really started to feel in adolescence. And as this quote indicates, a lot of young people wanted to know about their birth family and what they were like and something about them, even when they had a troubled history. They didn't, it's not automatically that children knew that difficult things had happened and they said, well, I, won't, I don't care of that person. I don't want to think about them. They still wanted to know, even when the history was difficult. And we see in the third quote, a young person talking about actually the loss of kind of lived experience of relationships and how she felt that had damaged her. I think it's damaged me in that I don't like leaving people now. You grow bonds with people and then you get torn away from each one. So children who are adopted older now, they do experience attachment relationships in their birth family and in their adoptive family. And when they lose these people and that loss is not addressed, then there's maybe this sense of not wanting to risk getting close to other people again. So I don't think we have fixed all these problems with, with loss and identity issues in adoption yet. There's more we can do. So what are we currently doing in relation to birth family contact? Well, this picture is really based on our research in England, but um, I understand the situation might be quite similar in Wales, that direct contact with parents tends to be very rare for adopted children. I think it's possibly even declined over the last 20 years. I certainly don't think it's increased. Indirect contact remains the kind of normal standard plan. It's almost a cut and paste type of contact planning, but it remains a problematic form of contact. I think we have learned a lot over the last 20 years of maybe supporting letterbox contact a little bit better than we did in the early days. 
But still, even research that we've carried out quite recently in England indicates that in a high number of cases, over half letterbox contact fairly quickly runs into problems where one or both sides do not you know stop the communication and even when the 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 letters do go back and forth often people um, feel that those letters are really difficult to write they can be quite uninformative they can feel a bit cold and not give a real sense of the other person and not maybe address the questions that the child really has. So um, I think we do need to think about indirect contact. When it comes to sibling contact, we see that there is a greater possibility of some ongoing face-to-face -face meetings, but that will be typically when the siblings are also adopted or possibly in long-term care. And uh, any children who remain significantly in touch with the parents are likely to be excluded from sibling contact. So loss of sibling relationships is really, really widespread in adoption. In a recent survey of over 300 families, we found that a um, very, very small number of children were in touch with all of their siblings. The involvement of grandparents in post-adoption contact is very low, despite evidence from research that grandparent contact is often very positive and has less challenges maybe than birth parent contact. So I think we need to think about the whole birth family, not just birth parents. And we see that at the moment, there's still uh, not that much direct contact going on. It's very, very different picture to um, children in long-term foster care or kinship care, where it's much more a normal expectation that these kind of relationships will be allowed to continue. Yet the adopted children tend to come from really the same backgrounds as these children in other forms of permanency. Often the adopted children have brothers and sisters in this other form of permanency. So it does beg questions about why are the adopted children treated so differently. So let's think about identity. And I'm drawing here on um, Dan McAdam's work about narrative identity and adoption. So he says, essentially, our identity is the stories that we tell about ourselves. Often, when, you know, when we meet a new person and um, we want to give them a sense of who we are, we tell stories. We, we say something about where we've come from. We say something about what we're doing now and we might mention our aspirations for the future, where we're going to go. And these, these stories that we tell about ourselves, they constantly change and evolve. We get new uh, understandings and feelings about our own life story and we construct and actively make sense and meaning of our own lives. So I think we need to really, this is a really useful framework for thinking about adopted children. How easy or difficult is, is it for them to have this sense of identity, particularly where that looking back bit is clouded by all sorts of mysteries, by lack of information, by lack of contact, possibly by distorted memories or difficult memories. It can be maybe really hard for young people to think about who they are and where they're going to go in the future. So, Adopted um, people might have all sorts of questions. And I think these questions can often, um, young people might start to ask these questions as early as about seven and eight. We know that's when children's understanding of adoption takes a bit of a leap in middle childhood, but they really intensify in adolescence. And these questions carry on into adulthood. We're doing a study at the moment of adult adoptees who have had their own children. And we can see that for some people, you know, having a baby triggers a lots of these questions if they haven't asked them before. So who do I resemble? I think this why was I removed from my birth parents is a really important question. Why did it happen to me? And incorporating maybe difficult and painful information about their past might make adopted people want to ask, what does this say about me and the type of person that I am? They might ask questions about the social 
meaning of their identity as an adoptive person. And just actually wanting to know the facts, not just maybe the difficult facts of why was I adopted, um, but uh, just maybe things like, you know, when did I take my first steps? What were my first words? What foods did I like as a baby? Um, often it's foster carers who have a lot of this information as well, not just the birth family. And it can get lost when uh, children's lives are really segmented and the discon discontinuous, discontinuous, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so if children um, carry on and stay in contact with their birth family members, how does that work out for them? And particularly, does it affect the positives of adoption? You know, does it undermine their relationships with their adoptive parents, damage their sense of permanency and connection in the adoptive family, um, stop them recovering from developmental harm? These are questions that we explored in our longitudinal study, where we followed up um, a group of children, about half of whom had direct contact with a parent or grandparent, and the other half had indirect contact. And what we saw in the last follow up when these young people were average age 18, that some of them were doing really well, some of them were doing less well. We know that's a typical pattern. You found that here in Wales in your own studies that have been carried on at Cardiff that, you know, children's outcomes are quite heterogeneous. But um, how well or not well young people were doing seemed much more strongly driven by other factors as opposed to what contact they were having with their birth family. So factors that we know are very important are things like the age at which the child is adopted, the extent of abuse or neglect they've experienced, the number of placement changes they might have had, the exposure they've had to damaging substances in utero, all these factors are really important in driving adopted children's outcomes, as well, of course, of the quality of the adoptive family environment. So compared to these other factors, we really could not see any significant effects of the type of birth family contact that people were having on their overall development. When we looked much more specifically at their identity development, the ability of the young person to tell a coherent story about themselves as an adoptive person, to be able to reflect on where they come from, who they were now, and where they thought they were going in the future, we saw that young people who'd had higher levels of contact were more able to do that. So we did feel that um, direct contact in particular um, was assisting young people with identity development. Now that direct contact was um, often linked not just to seeing the birth family, but to having a higher level of communication with adoptive parents. So the openness of adoptive parents to thinking and talking about adoption also is really important in promoting adopted children's identity development. It was actually really difficult in our study for us to say which of these two types of openness is more important. Is it the birth family contact? Is it the conversations with the adoptive parents? The reason why it was difficult for us to say which is most important is because in so many cases, they just went hand in hand. The adoptive parents, you know, explained to us that having meetings with the birth family enabled them to have conversations with their child. It forced them to have conversations. In contrast, a letter coming from the birth family gives you choices. Yes, you can sit down and use that as a communicative tool with your child to ask them what, do, what would they like to ask their birth parent? What do they want to say? Do they have any questions? How are they feeling? You can use it in that way, but you don't have to. You might um, just have the correspondence yourself between the birth family and not involve your child. You might save those letters for this kind of magical point in the future when the time is right. And we saw some parents putting that off and off and off. Um, some parents refuse to have the letters sent on to them from the agency. So it has very different effect. 
and also people felt that the the communication uh, the medium in which you could address really important questions like what happened to me when I was younger and how does my birth parent feel about me now are really difficult to do in a letter format with somebody you may never have met when actually we're, we're all really out of practice in writing letters now. Now, overall, although I'm highlighting some maybe differences of face-to-face -face contact versus direct contact, what we saw was that contact plans need to be very individualized for children. You know, for some children, direct contact was the right plan and seemed to have a number of benefits. For other people, it didn't work that well. You know, for some people, um, indirect contact worked really well. So I would say every contact plan we looked at had some level of benefit and some level of challenge. And what we have to do, I think, in practice is look um, at that balance between the benefits and challenges and make sure that we're getting more benefits and we're trying to minimise and help people with the challenges. We also have to recognise that the balance of benefits and challenges uh, varies you know, from person to person. And also in one family, it will vary over time as people's needs, situations and feelings change. So if we look at the example of Reese, a young man who took part in our study, he had um, some letter contact with grandparents, no contact with his birth mother. He was adopted about the age of four. And so he had this contact with his parents um, cut off when he was adopted. And at the age of eight, he was absolutely fine with that. In fact, he was quite insistent that that was absolutely the right thing. He said, they're out of my life now. But when we went back to talk to him in his late teenage years, and he reflected back over the past 10 years, he told us that how he thought about this really changed quite dramatically as he came into teenage, his teenage years. And instead of thinking, she's out of my life, he said he was thinking constantly about his birth mum. He had all sorts of mixed and complex feelings. Was it something that I done? Why me out of everyone? What's her problem? Why won't she contact me? So sometimes anger at his birth mum, sometimes blaming himself. And he really wanted to reopen contact with him. But everybody said to him, because he was a troubled teenager, no, don't do it now, Reese. Wait till you're older. It's not the right time. But the intensity of his feelings was such that he couldn't wait. And uh, he contacted his mum on Facebook and reconnected with her. And actually, that didn't work out terribly well for him because, you know, he'd had a lot of kind of fantasies and just not knowing about his mum. And, uh, and when he did meet up with her, he felt she wasn't the person he hoped she might be. And he cut off that contact again. So we can see how these feelings change as people grow and change. So we have to remain open to reviewing plans. And I think we have to listen to kids when they say, I need something different now and not say, wait till you're 18. Now, we looked at young people's satisfaction with openness, and that was particularly associated with contact plans that were stable uh, and the quality of contact rather than the type. And most dissatisfactions that young people had related to gaps in their contact. So they talked about, you know, not knowing anything about their fathers um, or that side of the family. They talked about parents who didn't write back to letters, brothers or sisters they'd lost contact with. That was that was what young people generally complained about. They didn't generally complain if they had contact that had been kept up over the years of whatever type they tended to identify benefits associated with that. And they rather took their contact plan for granted as if it were the norm. 
most young people, um, the vast majority, did talk about benefits in having contact and they almost came from a child's rights perspective, arguing that the option should be there and it shouldn't be up to social workers when they're babies to cut that off for them. They should have a level of contact built into their adoption such that they can get some answers to these questions and make up their own, make more informed decisions when they're older about do they want to open things up? Do they want to close things down? And the findings from our research, I think, really echo with the broader research base. So recently, the Nuffield Family Justice Obser Observatory have commissioned a literature review of the research around contact and children's well-being. This cuts across all placement types. And the research team have synthesized findings from 49 studies. And um, here's some of their conclusions. So they talk about, you know, we mustn't really, we've got to get away from thinking about, well, what type of contact is best? And we need to think about how can we facilitate positive experiences and meaningful involvement of people who matter to the child. And I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. Getting away from contact, which is a cold word and doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the experience, to think about meaningful involvement with people who matter. They talk about the importance of contact being well facilitated and where it is, it's associated with positive outcomes for the child and where it's poorly managed, it's associated with risks. So we see that contact by itself is not necessarily a good thing. It depends on the quality of contact. And we need to have um, a very differentiated and dynamic approach that where we're clear about why we're doing it. So I think for some adopted children, we may be doing contact because they have significant relationships with people in their family, like brothers or sisters, and we want those relationships to continue. In other cases, they may even have entered care at birth and not attached to anyone in their birth family, but they, they have identity needs and that's why we're doing contact. So we need to be clear of the purpose and match that to how we set up and manage the contact. And we need to support everybody involved. So that you can see how our research fits with the, the broader base very well. So I think, you know, when it comes to birth family contact, we really need to think about um, planning. We need to think about how can we get an arrangement in place that respects the child as a member of their birth family and also respects them as a member of their adoptive family. So we need adoptive parents and birth parents working together. We've got to have a relational approach. We've got to bring people together. Whereas in adoption, we work very hard at keeping people apart. We need to have a much more individualized approach and dump this sort of cut and paste, it's adoption, it's letterbox type policy. Um, and we need to match the support to the needs of families. So some families will need a lot of support. Some parents will need a lot of support. Some families, the best thing we can do where we've got lots of strengths in the birth family, lots of strengths in the adoptive family is encourage them to maybe find a plan that they can manage themselves and works for themselves. So I think what are some of the um, barriers to improving our contact situation? Well, I think there is entrenched thinking amongst professionals and maybe a risk averse practice. I think people are very driven by the anxieties of prospective adopters and that can drive what plans professionals think are feasible. There is a lack of support for birth families and, and birth families do need help with writing letters and meeting adoptive parents and staying in contact with their child. Because there's no simple formula, it's a complex area of practice. And I think that makes us sometimes rely on more simple formula where we need to embrace and work with that complexity. And I think also coming from a government level, there hasn't been a focus on birth family links in adoption. There's been a focus on other things like timeliness in adoption and recruiting more adoptions and, and maybe post-adoption support and therapeutic services. That's where the government focus has been and that's maybe where professionals have put their efforts. 
So I think to address some of these problems, we do need to uh, kind of raise awareness and try and change the professional culture. We need to, with our prospective adopters, really build their perspective taking, help them get them inside the mind, not of just the adopted toddler, but the teenager, the young adult, and get that lifelong view of adoption and build their confidence. Um, we need to do more individual planning and risk assessment. We need to set achievable goals because it's important that whatever contact we plan is something that people can actually commit to and keep up. And it's better, I think, to start with a modest plan with a view to building it up than kind of just go in with a massively unachievable plan that fails and leaves people actually feeling even more disappointed than before they began. It is an area of practice that we need to give greater attention to and priority. And I think we do need to really think in a way about relationships, meaningful involvement, family, loss, identity, all the things that underpin contact. What is contact really about? Get under the word. So I want to move on now to talk about this area of loss in the foster family. And, you know, when a child moves to adoption, it's a moment of opportunity, but it's also a moment of risk because it often involves separation and loss of significant attachment figures. This is happening to children, vulnerable children at a vulnerable age. And in the context of having this experience of loss, they then have to build a new relationship. We know that when children move to adoption, the moves are often quite abrupt, you know, one to two weeks and you've lost maybe the only person you've ever lived with or the only person you've ever felt safe living with. And they're gone from your life. And the professional advice is don't see them again for several weeks or months um, because you need to bond with your adoptive family. These moves are incredibly stressful for everybody, adoptive parents, foster carers and for children. And because of the adults' feelings, children's feelings can be overlooked. And difficult and stressful, stressful transitions do, there is growing evidence, have a long-term impact on the success of children's adoption. So it's a really important area of practice. So with my colleagues, Mary Beek and Gillian Schofield, we developed uh, a new model to move children to adoption that we hoped would guide practitioners to make more child-centered uh, moves to adoption. And we built our uh, model on feedback from people in the sector who were already innovating and trying different things because there was a lot of good practice going on. And we looked at the existing research and the ex existing practice and we developed a new model and we trialed it in a couple of agencies. And then we refined the model and we got some more funding to kind of develop our thinking and develop practice materials. So our model is really based, it's an attachment theory based model, and we're drawing on Mary and Jill's work on the secure base model and these different dimensions. And really we're thinking about, I suppose we're promoting the idea of the foster carer as providing a secure base to the child while they're in, chair, in care and continuing to provide a secure base to the child as they move through this stressful transition at the same time as the adoptive parent is trying to build up their secure base with the child. So it's about overlapping caregiving, essentially. It's not a prescriptive model. It doesn't say on day one, do this, on day four, do that. Um, instead, it relies on six key principles. And again, as with contact, we're arguing for individual planning. So our six key principles I'm going to go through quickly now. Firstly, that we need to think about the relationships between the carers. If the adults are working together and are confident in each other, that's going to help the child feel more comfortable with the move. So we've got to try and build those relationships from an early stage. We need to let the child and the adoptive parents have a chance to get to know each other before the adoptive parents attempt to care for the child. 
So there should be periods of, you know, observation and play to familiarise um, the adopters and the child with each other. A longer lead in to the move, essentially. We should move at the pace that the child needs to move and try and resist all the other demands on how quickly or slowly we should move. We need to remain sensitive and attuned to the child's feelings about the move so that we can adjust things if it's not going at the right pace for the child and we can uh, mitigate their loss wherever possible. We need to build in as much continuity as possible and that includes particularly continuity of foster family relationships after the move. We should not be saying cut off the foster family contact for a period of time to help the child settle. We need to be saying build in the foster family contact to help the child settle. And we need to have flexible plans and involve everybody in the plan. So we're doing this with people, not to people. So we're suggesting that people can think about moving children in relation to these three stages. So first of all, after we've uh, agreed the match of the adopters with the child, we say there should be a stage where everybody's getting to know each other. Foster carers, adopters are getting to know each other. Adopters and the child are getting to know each other. And crucially at this stage, adopters are not taking on caregiving tasks. The foster carer at this stage remains the secure base for the child and should be physically and psychologically present. So we suggest setting up meetings between the foster carer and the doctors. You don't need professionals there. You don't want the child there just for them to start talking and getting to know each other and sharing information. This can be in person, but supported by phone conversations and all the digital contact we've all become so good at. And when adopters start to visit the foster home, we, you should think in terms of observe and play. Um, rather than caregiving. And the feedback we had was that, you know, this was really important to try and build up this connection before the caregiving starts. Adoptive parents were really positive about that. We also saw during the pandemic that that observation and play and familiarity between the carers, there's a lot that can be done using digital methods as well. So we put some specific guidance on our website about engaging playful activities that adopters can do with children as a way of getting to know them before the move. Stage two is pretty similar to the previous methods we had of moving children, more intensive visits, probably daily visits, building up and adoptive parents here now are doing the hands on care. So we say you're ready to do this when you see that trust and rapport between the adults and you see children starting to respond more confidently to adopters. So during this period, both the foster carer and the adopters are providing elements of the secure base for the child. And they need to kind of really work together so that foster carers know there might be situations where they have to step in and take over and reassure the child. But there's other situations where they really need to stand back and let adoptive parents do it. So you can see how crucial that relationship between the adults is. So you know, initially foster carers would want to be physically present, but gradually maybe they're in the room and then they're in the next room and then they're upstairs and then maybe the adoptive parents uh, are on their own with the child for, for periods. Foster carers can be taking the child to the adoptive family because that's a scary experience and staying with them on visits there. It's a time when we really need to monitor and communicate about the ch child's feelings carefully and to really recognise this loss that children have. So it's not all about, isn't it lovely you're moving to a new family, but recognise that children might feel sad as well about everyone they're going to miss. And the feedback we had about this stage is that people felt a lot easier in this intense period where they'd had that longer lead up to it. And finally, in stage three, once children had moved, um, 
we're saying there's another period where you've got to think about continuity and secure base up to the first review after the placement. So here the child is looking primarily to their adoptive parents to provide their secure base, but at the same time we have to recognise the loss that they've experienced. Um, and foster carers should be fading out gradually, not disappearing off a cliff on moving day. So foster carers should be there to kind of reassure the child, but also really promote the role of the adoptive parents as offering the secure base. And again, we had mostly positive feedback about foster carer visits, although they can be very emotional and people needed to manage that. So all our practice materials you can find on our website here. And finally, just to draw the talk together, I want to talk about the role of adoptive parents in bringing this all together, because I focused a lot on the foster family and the adoptive family. But obviously, going forward, adoptive parents are the most important resource for the child in terms of recognising their relationships and their identity. And of course, the most important thing in adoption is that children feel they have a secure base in their adoptive family. But I would argue that where adoptive parents recognise and promote all of children's connections and identities, that really helps the child to feel secure in their adoptive family. It doesn't detract from it. So adoptive parents really need to be physically and psychologically available to their children to explore these losses and to explore these identities. It mustn't be a no-go topic. They've got to be really sensitive to children's feelings, help name them, acknowledge them, manage them. So that means that adoptive parents themselves must not be defensive about these other people that the children might think about or even love. They need to show acceptance of the strengths and difficulties of past carers so that children get a realistic picture of their background. Um, they need to cooperate with their child to find the right comfort level for their child. Some children really are desperate to talk about all of this. Some children need a lot of more gentle approach and teasing it out. So we have to work with children. And of course, you need to say to your kids, you know, we love you. You're part of our family. You're always going to be part of our family. But it's not an exclusive either or situation, but allow children to feel part of their birth family as well. And I think what the kids in our study told us is that just made them feel even closer to their adoptive parents when adoptive parents could do that. So on that note, I'm going to end and take questions and, you know, we've got so many resources on, on the internet now, so hopefully you can follow up some of these links and find more about our practice resources and research. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very, very much. That was fantastic, Beth. Really engaging and thought provoking. Um, we've got quite a few questions and I'm not quite sure we'll have time to go through them all, but I'll start to pose them now. So the first one is from Miranda and it's, um, do you have any information about how a young person could go about finding their birth father when they don't have very much information to go on, for example, dates of birth, etc.? Well, um, I think, first of all, we need to ask that question at the point we're placing children so that um, we're getting better at keeping records and documenting that information and following up more assiduously on the father's side of the family. Um, because, you know, it's much harder to get it later on when that early work hasn't been done. But if you are working with a teenager, I suppose it is about going back to the files, going back to the agency and seeing what's there. Um, sometimes it's about going back to the mum and seeing what she can tell and what she can help with. Um, I think we do need to make 
these kind of services and, and support for young people available before they're 18 and not just say, you know, you can use these services when you're 18. Because I think that is a very common kind of idea that adoptive parents have and professionals have that it's not possible to do this work with the child. So, yeah, I think that that's what I think about that, really. OK, um, thank you. Thank, thank you for your answer to that. And um, the next question, or it really it's more of a comment and it relates to the previous one, which is saying that quite often when you go back to files years later, it's not always that clear why people were removed. Um, that's just really a comment. I think, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I think um, that um, it is the the work that we do when when we when we're working with an adopted child and they're often a baby or a toddler we've really got to have in our minds that teenager that young adult and put ourselves in their shoes and think what do they want to know what that what will they want to know later on and get as much down on paper as we can and um you know i think facts it's important to document facts and to make sure they're for the child they're there for the child um, rather than necessarily putting a spin on it because um, sometimes I think when we do things like letters for later life uh, we might make it um, you know sanitize it in a way uh, and that can leave children feeling quite confused. Well, if my birth family did love me so much and care about me so much, and that's what the, the letter for later life is focusing on, why was I taken away? They do need to know the facts as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's all these areas of work are connected. And, and maybe there's there's a lot, um, a possibility there for for people working with adopted adults and adopted teenagers to collaborate with the practitioners working with adopted babies and toddlers, because those practitioners working with the older people would have a real idea of what needs to be in those files and folders and records. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Lisa Wolf, and she asks, is, is um, their research identifying the factors that suggest contact would be helpful or unhelpful? So, for example, factors relating to the birth family or perhaps the nature of any abuse or the adoptive family? Yes, um, I think there is. And uh, there's lots of information about that. I mean, the key things I will highlight is um, the, the collaborative relationship between the birth family and the adoptive family. So we know, for example, adoptive parents who have a more open minded attitude, who are more confident themselves, who are less anxious and defensive are much better able to promote birth family contact. We also know on the birth family side that birth family members who can get to a point where they can work collaboratively with the adoptive family and can recognize and support their child's connection to the adoptive family, even if they did not want their child to be adopted, that's really important and underpins successful contact for the child. So we need to, I think, um, not just assess these characteristics in the adoptive family and the birth family, we need to help people to get to this point because these are malleable um, uh, qualities in a lot of cases, I think. So we have to help our adoptive parents feel more confident and more able to do this. And we have to support adoptive parents Ideally, from the point adoption is identified as the plan, the more support parents have going through the adoption process, I think the more able they are to reach this supportive position. So there's the quality of the adults, definitely experiences of abuse and neglect, the questioner mentioned, and we know that um, it's maybe easier for children to derive benefits from contact where it is with a member of the birth family who was not involved in their abuse and neglect. 
So I think, you know, if you want to start somewhere in changing cultures around contact, that's a very easy place to start. Think about grandparents, think about brothers and sisters, um, think about, um, you know, a non-abusing parent um, and, you know, work with those people because it's a much easier dynamic for the child when the person they're going to see they haven't got this really difficult relationship with on the other hand um you know we we need to rule out when direct contact is not appropriate for children and i would highlight in particular where children have a very fearful relationship with their parents when they're frightened of them that's maybe not a good situation in which to plan contact with those parents. So there is child characteristics, there's parent characteristics, um, and then there's the amount of support that goes in. So, you know, if you've got a situation where adoptive parents are a bit anxious and defensive and the birth family are still a bit um, angry and resistant, it may be you can still have a really positive contact experience if you put the support in. Um, with those people. And the reason I say that is because the contact experience in itself can be transformative. So we saw this in our longitudinal study, how adoptive parents told us that, you know, they felt very anxious about the birth family. But when they met them, they felt much more positive, they felt more sympathetic towards them, and they felt that they were less of a threat. And birth families, on the other hand, would say, you know, say things, I quote, I often use from a birth mother, it says, I wanted to hate the adoptive parents, they were taking my children away. But when I met them, I couldn't hate them because they were lovely. And they were lovely to me. So positive experience of contact is something that can transform birth parents experiences. Even just to meet the adoptive parents once, for birth parents and adoptive parents to meet once, we saw increased empathy on both sides and increased the likelihood that indirect contact would persist over time. So we need to build this mutual understanding. Okay, hey, and thank, thank you, Beth. Um, the next question is from Cyril, um, Cyril Burford, saying, what could schools do to improve the experiences of adopted children and young people? Um, I think uh, that schools are really massively important for children. You know, children spend six hours a day there. And we need to think about the school as a secure base for the child. So that's a brilliant question that you've asked me because Mary and Jill have really expanded their secure base model to also look at how schools can incorporate this model. So if you look on the secure base website that I've got up here, there's a section on there in there about schools. So I think the schools need to be, you know, really tuned in to children's relational needs, tuned into the trauma that they've experienced. And I think adopted children need more help in schools. Um, they need better assessment early on of their developmental needs, um, uh, rather than kind of placing a child for adoption and thinking that's the intervention, that's the intervention we're giving this child, a new family and stability. We have to think these children have experienced loss and trauma. They are likely to have experienced developmental damage. Let's get as good a picture as possible as their likely future therapeutic needs and plan from that from the beginning. And mental health services and good support in school are absolutely crucial areas. Okay, thank, thank you, Beth. That's really helpful. I think we've probably just got time for one more question, which is um, from Simon Cardi, which is, um, would it help for local authorities to keep cases open to support contact? Um, yes, basically. Um, I think particularly in the early days, that's when people need the most help. Um, even, you know, the case will be open before the adoption order and there's a lot. So I think that's a good time to do a lot of this work because you are involved and nobody's going to pressure you to close the case before the child is adopted. So the earlier we can try and build these collaborative relationships, the better. 
Um, you know, people were very anxious in our study about how contact was going to go in the early days. Um, but if they had a lot of support in the beginning and they built a sense of trust, that's the most important thing. You've got to have trust between the birth family and the adoptive family. If you can build that trust, then you can pull out. And I would say that's the way to do it rather than let people try let people get into a bit of a muddle and a fail and then try and build the trust because in the process of failing trust will have been undermined you know an adopted parent who just diligently sits down and writes their letterbox every year and they do it for three years and they get no reply at the end of those three years they might think well I started this with a lot of goodwill and now I just think that birth family can't be bothered and don't care um, it, it's better to help that mum to write back for the first three years, at the end of which the adoptive family might think, oh, I'm really glad I've done this. And people will get something going that then you can pull out. So I would say put, put the support in early on and then pull back when you've got the trust. Also, if the case is closed, um, is there a way of just checking in with people, just checking in maybe every year or every two years? Or I, I would highlight key times to check in are around about seven and eight when children's understanding grows and they start to ask a lot more questions and have more complex and difficult feelings. That's a good time to check in with the doctors. When the child is making that transition to secondary school, entering puberty, early adolescence, a really good time to check in. And definitely the young people in our study emphasize, please, somebody check in with us when we are 18, because we don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of young people felt they needed help and not necessarily from their adoptive parents, but from somebody kind of a bit more neutral they needed help to decide where did they want to go next so that those certainly those key times to step back in so some thoughts about that okay thank you um, very much Beth we've got lots lots more questions but we're not going to be able to I don't think pose anymore but lots of also very very positive comments about your talk and lots of comments saying that we hope that Wales is going to be moving in the same way um, towards open adoption. So really, thank you very, very much. And if people could, uh, I don't know if they can take off their mute. I was just going to say to applaud you, but thank you very much. It was a fascinating um, lecture, really helpful um, in terms of thinking about practice going forward. And just to say that it will be available, um, the recording on the YouTube channel, and there are details in the chat, but we can also send it send out an email link to participants so thank you very very much um, that's been a fantastic um, opportunity for people to hear can you. i say one more thing alison of course you can yes i'm <laughs> um, just on on that first website the research in practice contact website we've got some really lovely resources to use with prospective adoptive parents we've got a film of adopted young people talking about their experiences of adoption and contact we've got an adopted mum and a birth grandma talking about how they've made contact work so there's really nice resources in there for some of the practice work we've been talking about and um, thank you for inviting me Alison and thank you for the really interesting questions and for listening everybody fantastic thank you very very much um, we'll we'll draw this uh, lecture to a close thank you